Hello and welcome back. I'm Mary Kirchhoff, Executive Vice President for Scientific Advancement at the American Chemical Society. Following Dr. Hrabowski's fantastic opening talk, we will now proceed with our first session, which presents established programs that work to build a climate conducive to DEI and or work to enhance DEI in the talent pool. This session is split into two panel sessions and will take us through to the end of day one. Before the first panel session begins, we are delighted to have Dr. Dontari Stallings here to share relevant data that will help ground the subsequent discussions. Dr. Stallings is Assistant Teaching Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego, as well as the Associate Director of Oxide, which is the Open Chemistry Collaborative in Diversity Equity, where he works to generate policy solutions that increase diversity and inclusion within the chemistry field. Please feel free to enter any clarifying questions you have in the chat during Dr. Stallings' presentation. Don Tari, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. And um, I'm looking forward to this, this afternoon and all of the, the talks that are coming after this. Um, so, you know, the, the title of my talk is Demographic Data Cultivating Change. And, and we, and, and when I say we, I mean our nation, um, our institutions, our departments, our research groups, we're at a tipping point with respect to DEI, where opportunity meets needs meets timing. And as a profession, our, our practices and policies and our procedures in the past, they're not guaranteed to actually produce a successful tomorrow. And in large part, that's because the demographics of the people that produce past successes don't correlate to the demographics of the individuals that we will need to fill our future classrooms, our professorate, our research groups, our industrial teams, and our institutions. Those are individuals that our practices and policies and procedures have marginalized. And we've created a climate where um, our profession and field is actually not their field of choice. And, and that really is the crux of what we're gonna be battling. Uh, uh, let me see, there we go. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide a quantitative foundation for the following discussions. And in order to do that, we need to define the stage that we're going to be discussing. Now, oftentimes um, you hear the situation discussed in terms of say uh, a leaky pipeline. I like us to actually reimagine the pipeline because the pipeline focuses on losses. And it focuses on the failure of individuals to matriculate. It puts blame on individuals in a lot of ways. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you see an image with a ladder. And on every rung of the ladder, it notes um, educational or professional advancement. Now at every single stage or transition of this ladder, the students or professionals have the opportunity to opt out. And when I say opt out, I mean leave our profession. So what we need to do is we need to motivate students and professionals to actually opt in. And, and you know, this is because we're, we're losing people to better choices. And we need to make the choice to stay in our, in our field or on our academic tracks more attractive so that more people are opting in. And because of that, and because of the setup, every single rung, every transition that you see here represents an opportunity where uh, strategic interventions can be performed to increase the likelihood that people opt into this profession. And during the next couple of days, you're gonna hear interventions that occur at every stage of this ladder. Um, and you know, and I'll, I'll go ahead and plug Oxide. At Oxide, we believe that uh, faculty play a central, a critical role with respect to changing the demographics of our field. As you see on the right-hand side, faculty interact with a large component of all of these particular cohorts. You know, and even to be more in depth, you know, faculty are engaged to affect the academic mission at every stage of this ladder. And as such, the demographics of our professorate becomes a bellwether for inclusivity within our field. I mean, if you think about it, if you don't see people who look like you teaching you, 
what makes you think that you know this is a path that's for you? So the data that you see in front of you comes from a publication from Oxide in 2014. Uh, this is a table that speaks toward the professional advancement of four different cohorts. We have women, individuals that are black, individuals from uh, that are Latinx, and individuals that uh, are Native American. Each cohort has a set of bar graphs that indicate their relative percentage with respect to uh, the US demographics, percentage of individuals attaining BS degrees, percentage of individuals attaining PH degrees, and percentage of assistant associate and full professors. Now you see the, the drop for each one of these cohorts, but oftentimes people focus primarily uh, on the drop between, um, you know, between the US population and the bachelor's degree. Now, there's nothing wrong with focusing on that drop. Please don't, don't get me wrong. But you know, there are also other drops here that are equally important. And I wanna point out that the drop that, that Oxide focuses on for the most part it's a drop between the transition between someone becoming a PhD and then becoming a full faculty member. And the reason why this drop is important to us is because um, this is a, a drop that colleges and universities can actually directly affect. And colleges and universities have a substantial and play a substantial role in the demographics of individuals that they hire. So as we move forward, in addition to looking at uh, the PhD to full faculty transition, we are going to discuss all of these transitions in greater detail. Now, the data noted here comes from uh, the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, and it was actually published in April. So this is 2018 data that just got published. As many of you know, the, the demographics of individuals that are Black and individuals that are Latinx and individuals that are Native American uh, and individuals that are of mixed race are often lumped into one combined category. And in this talk, that combined category will be noted as um, underrepresented people of color, or URPLC. And this is because collectively, there are people of color that are underrepresented demographically within our respective fields, within chemistry and chemical engineering. And the table that you see in front of you disaggregates the underrepresented people of color and tracks their matriculation through college. And, you know, as you see, if you look at the U.S. population, the individuals enrolling into the college, you note that those numbers are pretty on point. They're commensurate. Right, you can see that these numbers don't really shift. So that means that we are currently enrolling individuals in the college at rates and percentages that are demogra uh, demographically proportional to the US population. Now, with that said, if you look at the degrees conferred for both chemistry and chemical engineering, you notice that there's a substantial drop. So within the United States, 34% of the population come from URPLC groups. But 25.3% of our chemistry degrees come from that same cohort. And 18.7% of our Chem E degrees come from that same cohort. So that's to say that we're losing here. We're losing opportunities. We're not attracting talent and people are opting out. So the question is, why? What can we actually do to make it such that our fields, our majors, become the, the fields of choice for URPLC individuals? Because right now, we're not meeting those particular standards. Right now, they have choices, and we're just not their choice. So this is a similar table, uh, also uh, data pool from the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. And this table right here, this aggregates underrepresented people of color and tracks their matriculation through graduate school. So we're looking at uh, the highlights of the percentages of individuals that are earning PhDs and masters. 
And, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting because chemistry and chemical engineering are a little different here. For chemistry, with respect to PhDs, representation uh, in chemistry significantly drops as you go from a BS to a PhD, from 25% URPLC uh, to 12.9%. That's a substantial drop. And this is indicative of lost opportunities to recruit and retain students that graduate within our, our respective field. For chemical engineering, it's a little bit different. As it turns out, the representation within Chem E remains commensurate uh, between individuals that attain their, uh, their BS degree in Chem E and their PhD. So we're going 19% to around 19%, which is pretty awesome. This means that, that, that with respect to opportunity, demographic opportunity or availability, um, the Chem E field is actually um, moving forward at a clip that's commensurate. That's, that's a beautiful thing. But even though that's positive, let's look at these numbers. 19% and roughly 13%. Both of these numbers fall far short of being numbers that correspond to the United States demographic availability, which means that we can do more and we have to do more to stay competitive as we move forward with research in our nation. All right, so that's the story of going from enrolling into college, getting your bachelor's degree, going from your bachelor's degree and getting up to your PhD degree. Now, the next phase is gonna be the professor. The data noted here comes from um, Zipia. And what I want you to note here is that uh, this data tracks the demographic representation within the professorate of Chem E departments. On the right hand side, you have a table that has uh, white, Asian, uh, Latinx, and Black uh, percentages of faculty members from 2010 to 2018. And we're going to focus on the 2018 numbers because those are the most recently uh, recent numbers uh, that are shown inside this particular data. So when we compare the percentages of individuals that earn PhDs versus the percentage of URPLC faculty, you notice that there's a gap, right? We're looking at 19% versus 11.5%. Now this gap is quite substantial, but what it represents is truly an opportunity because right now hiring, you know, with respect to Kim E and faculty is not matching availability. So the question should be asked, you know, during the hiring pool, um, are people choosing not to actually apply? Uh, what, what do your application pools look like? Or are we doing a poor job of recognizing talent? I'm sure it's probably a combination of both which means that these are fixes and opportunities that as faculty members and departments can easily be uh, adjusted and changed via effective practices and policies. So this right here is data that was generated by Oxide. Um, so in chemistry, <laughs> we have a similar problem as Kim E. Uh, we're looking at uh, our availability gap, um, which goes from 13% of PhDs for URPLC faculty, or, uh, PhDs versus 5.5% with faculty. This is significant. So we, we're asking ourselves, or have to ask ourselves, the same exact question. How are we failing? Is it a, a lack of individuals applying, or are we not effectively noting talent? Now, those, those, those stories aren't happy stories, but there is some positive here. There's a positive trend in both the percentages and the total faculty members within chemistry. Um, this data here between 11 and 2018 also happens to be the time frame in which oxide has existed. Um, and, and what I want you to note about these numbers is that while 4.65 to 5.5 feels and looks like a small number, 
it is actually quite substantial. We're looking at a 30% increase over seven years. And these are real values, 67 um, URPLC faculty to 87 URPLC faculty. And so, you know, th those are good numbers. They're not great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that this is spectacular. I'm just saying that it's, it's trending in a positive direction. Um, but the trend isn't substantial, as substantial as we like it to be. But let's, let's dive into how this is occurring a little bit more. Five minutes, Dantari. Thank you so much. So on the screen right now, uh, this is some more data that's produced by Oxide. You have uh, disaggregated total faculty members um, for every single rank from assistant professors to associate professors to full professors. You also have the data for the total professors on here as well. Uh, so in chemistry, uh, what I want you to note here is that uh, what we're really looking at is uh, a change in the percentile of assistant professors. So for URPLC full professors, it was 5.5%. But if you look at the assistant professors with respect to chemistry, assistant professors, it's 9.5%, or excuse me, 9.7% of the cohort. That's, that's, that's a substantially higher value, right? So this particular change uh, has been positive. It doesn't quite meet total availability, but it's trending in the right directions. Equally to be noted here, you note that the associate professors have gone down. This trend is occurring because um, it reflects the, the diminishing aspects of under promotion within our field, meaning the associate professors are being uh, promoted to full professors. All right. So all that being said, um, what conclusions do we pull from this? The demographic data that we have shows that we are both failing and succeeding, more failing than succeeding. But what it does, it lays a platform, a foundation for where we can compare and contrast. Um, in the Oxide Project, we believe that, that in order for the demographic data to effectively change, this requires a focus on the promotion from doctorates to the professor, a focus on changing the demographics of the professor in a way that corresponds to the demographics of our nation. Overall, the, the numbers that demonstrate that we need systematic, system, uh, uh, systemic change is there. You can easily see that systemic change has to occur. And from the Oxide perspective, we believe that this requires intentional changes in policies and procedures, um, like, you know, like this workshop, you know, that are designed to inform, to motivate, and to uh, help structurally move the system in a way that's effective. And you know, with that being said, the only way that can occur is that at every level of leadership, someone is taking action right, that someone has ownership over the outcomes of demographics for your organization. So I'll, I'll leave with this statement. Um, there are a million paths for institutions to achieve inclusive excellence, but they can all be condensed into one. Make strategic efforts to improve yourself. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Sloan Foundation because Quite honestly, them believing in Oxide in a way that continues to fund us um, and resonating with our goals and aspirations has been something that's been very beneficial. Um, the Oxide board for always uh, supporting us and helping us to continue to make steps forward to become um, a, a better program. Uh, Professor Rigoberto Hernando, uh, Hernandez, who is the director of Oxide, who has been my partner this entire time, and he's He's an incredible person to work with and a great mentor. And also for both UCSD and Johns Hopkins for wanting to house Oxide on their respective campuses and supporting um, both of us as we move forward in our professional careers. Uh, and, and here's the biggest component. We've worked with so many departments and they partnered with us and we've learned from them and we've shared the information that we learned and we very much appreciate that. Uh, thank you for your time. 
Thanks so much, Dantari. You've really done a great job in laying out some of the data that's so important to helping us understand some of the, the bigger issues that we're facing and trying to address through this uh, workshop. Uh, we do have time for a couple of questions. We've had several come in from the uh, attendees. Um, so the first one is, should we, and this is from Chris Vanneke, should we begin to include individuals that do not fit the gender binary in our studies? We absolutely should. Um, I, I think that the, the for, for producing that data, that's hard. You're asking people to provide information that, that is invisible in a lot of ways. Uh, and so they have to out themselves, which makes it more, um, more of, a, you know, of a balancing act. This is, I don't think we'll ever, at least not in the next 10 years, get to the point where every single individual is gonna feel comfortable with providing that data. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope that as we move forward, we begin to get better numbers and information pertaining to that particular cohort. Thank you for that. Now, Satna has, is, is all the data you presented limited to US citizens or does it include all nationalities? Um, for the professorate data, it's all nationalities. For the student data, uh, it is uh, national data. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's also a question um, from Sapna about, is there an effort to fine grain the Asian data? And a couple of may also ask this question in a different way. Asia has uh, two of the most populous countries with different cultures and, inher cultures and heritage. And when you put them into one category, you're, you're sort of missing those cultural identities. So is there any effort to fine grain that a bit more than the data you're currently looking at? Absolutely. And Oxide has actually begun that with the way that we pool our uh, chemistry faculty data. We've we disaggregated those groups so that we can actually dive in because each one of those individual cohorts are having different experiences. Um, I would say that nationally, we're not at that point. Uh, yeah, you, you may have noticed that there was some data missing from, uh, you know, from chemistry, the disaggregated data uh, for the PhD. That wasn't because I didn't want to put it. That's because that data wasn't available. So we, we, we're still not to the point that we're still pulling effectively census data uh, for our fields in a way that's going to be effective. Thank you. Um, does Ox, oops, I just lost that question. Does Oxide have any specific recommendations for changes to faculty search processes to improve our ability to fairly evaluate a more diverse applicant pool? Oh, absolutely. So one of the things we do is we have a national diversity equity workshop where chairs from all over the nation come and they work and problem solve and produce recommendations. If you go to our website, you'll see a list of recommendations that chairs from across the nation have produced. Now, specifically to the hiring practices, um, this becomes an opportunity type scenario where when we fine tune searches that are really, really tight, Oftentimes, you may be missing out on excellent hiring opportunities because that person doesn't overlap with what you're searching for at this one moment, mm -hmm. right? But here's the thing. Because the numbers are so small, you won't get that opportunity again. So when we fine-tune our searches and make them so tiny, we're missing opportunities at great sci uh, with respect to great scientists. Um, and because of that, it's making it more difficult for our application pools to be as diverse as we want. But one of the things that a lot of a lot of universities are doing is they're doing opportunities of hire. They're as soon as they see an individual who uh, who's an excellent uh, opportunity, uh, in, instead of waiting for them to fit a certain role, they're going after those individuals. Mm -hmm. and, and by doing that, um, they're producing uh, demographics within the department that are much more commensurate with uh, the U.S. population. One last quick question, because we're just about out of time. Uh, do you have similar data for uh, uh, URPOC going into industry? That's from Sammy Sigmund. I, I don't, I don't, okay. but but I, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I wonder if I can just do some subtraction here because <laughs> that's where every, uh, between industry and government, that's where everyone else is going. So this competition is real. And to be honest, industry has been doing an amazing job, at least substantially better than academia of having um, their particular opportunities being something that people want to opt into. Yeah. Great. 
Great. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. We're giving you a virtual round of applause, even though I know you can't hear it. And thanks so much for your presentation, Dantari. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce my CSR colleague, Carlos Gonzalez of the uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. And Carlos will be leading us through the first panel session of this afternoon. Carlos. Well, thank you, Mary. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Tari, for a very nice presentation. Uh, data is very important. And I think uh, you actually touched all the points that are important regarding data. So, uh, Welcome to the first panel session uh, for this workshop. Uh, this panel session uh, will focus uh, specifically on established programs at work uh, to build climates uh, conducive to diversity, equity, and inclusivity in the chemical sciences. So we will hear from three invited speakers, each of whom will speak for approximately 20 minutes. Uh, note that I will actually interject uh, uh, to uh, give them the five minutes warning at the appropriate time so we can keep up with the, the, the schedule. At the end of each talk, uh, there will be time for a couple of uh, clarifying questions. Uh, and But most of the questions probably will, will actually move into the panel discussion that's gonna start at two o'clock uh, after all the presentations are, are, are done. And as a reminder, uh, let me just remind it again that uh, you can uh, submit your questions to the Q&A feature in Zoom in the chat. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce the first uh, speaker, Dr. Rebecca Rock, Executive Director of Merck Process Research and Development, where she leads uh, the Enabling Technologies Group. Uh, Dr. Rock has been actively involved in the external research community through academic collaborations, the creation of the Merck University Lectureship uh, Series, and also recruiting efforts where she focuses on women in chemistry, diversity, and inclusion. Rebecca? Great. Thank you, Carlos. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the invitation to speak here today. I'm, I'm really, I feel really privileged uh, to be able to present uh, on behalf of many outstanding colleagues I have at Merck uh, to, to share kind of the what, what we've done toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and I've titled this experiments in DEI because I do think we've treated DEI very much like an experimental science, being scientists and engineers. Uh, and so I'm gonna share some of that today, uh, recognizing that since I only have 20 minutes, uh, I'm gonna treat this like a manuscript and you'll only get to hear some of the experiments that actually worked, uh, but happy to, happy to chat about some of the things that were, that were less successful as well. And so uh, what you're gonna hear from me today is sort of what these experiments were and how we went about executing on them and some of the, some of the results from that. Uh, before, before I, you know, before I speak to kind of what these experiments were, I, I thought it's important to, to capture kind of what my motivation has been. Uh, and, and Carlos mentioned the women in chemistry piece. Uh, certainly that is something that, that motivates me personally um, based on my own experiences um, and has served as sort of the, the springboard uh, to become more interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion more broadly. Uh, on, a, on a technical level, um, I lead this group that, that's called Enabling Technologies, and, and I look at this as a bit of an experiment in diversity, an, an, an innova innovation incubator, if you will, because in a single group, we've combined biologists, chemists, and chemical engineers uh, with an eye toward getting the most out of each of these groups. And if you, you look at the graphic, you can see kind of the different um, capabilities that we have uh, within the team. But I think what's, what's most important here is, is our vision statement, um, that we will identify and leverage synergies that exist across the enabling technology group that allow for unparalleled delivery of enhanced capabilities, right? So this basically says we need to tap into that diversity in order to, to be able to um, innovate like we want, since innovation these days occurs so much at these interfaces. Um, so as I'm speaking on behalf of Merck, I thought it was important to at least cap have a slide that captures all the resources that are available to us at the company. And so uh, we've buck I've bucketed them into, into three, three different areas. One is corporate resources. So things like uncovering talent, which talks about covering uh, things like uh, unconscious bias toolkits and as well as uh, rewards and recognition. Uh, at the same time, uh, as a big company, we have 10 employee business resource groups uh, that are that are populated not by just 
individuals who who fall into those categories, but by but certainly by allies as well. So things like the Merck Women's Network, uh, LEAD, which is the uh, an association for employees of African descent and the Merck Rainbow Alliance. Uh, but really what, what I'm gonna focus on today is, is some of the, the things that we've been doing in process research and development at Merck. And I'll talk about some of the things that are, that are captured on this slide. Um, so, so how did we go about sort of bringing together our, our diversity and inclusion efforts at, at Merck in, in process research and development. Well, the story actually starts probably five or six years ago um, at, a, at a global chemistry event um, when uh, about a half dozen women uh, approached the senior vice president in the organization to tell him that he, in fact, had a woman problem. Um, and, uh, and with this, uh, we launched a series of women in chemistry roundtables. Uh, where we solicited feedback uh, from women across the organization to understand what these issues were. And things that came up were things like sponsorship, work-life balance, career progression, and transparency in decision-making. And so the action that came from that was to, was to really engage the leadership um, to, to lean into discomfort uh, when it comes to diversity. And in particular, a couple of our leads, myself and Nara Varin Kabul, um, sort of took on a role of reverse mentoring. So uh, providing mentorship to people senior to us uh, around our experiences and the experiences of those in the organization. Um, and so having done that, um, it became apparent to us that some of the efforts we were making around inclusion uh, were not limited to women, and in fact might have um, broader uptake, I guess you would say, if we broaden the focus um, to, to diversity and inclusion in general. And so uh, we continued on this path, thinking about things like talent development, unconscious bias, uh, and diversity in, in assignments. And, and for that latter piece, you know, what I'd emphasize, these were things like, how do we develop our talent, um, defining um, what some of these assignments are, things that are assignments that are career accelerating uh, versus sort of more housekeeping types of assignments. Um, and so that was successful. Uh, and then, uh, then the organization evolved um, and in, into process research and development, uh, we became uh, a, a modality agnostic group. So we brought in large and small molecules together and we thought it was time to revisit um, this, these round tables, this time sort of including people across, um, across all the groups, uh, not just women. Uh, we did handpick some of the attendees, but in general it was random. So we hit about 30% of the organization for these round tables, which were led by uh, seven or eight uh, DNI leaders in the organization. Uh, in order to get people to come, we supplied snacks. Um, so always, always helpful there. Uh, and, and I think this was our first, um, our first foray into really hearing, hearing the voices of this, this broader PR&D organization and understanding what was on their minds. And, and the themes were similar, things like career development, mentor and, mentorship and sponsorship and inclusion. And this, from what we heard at these round tables, I think we, we were able to craft a plan of some actions um, that we were poised to take to really impact how process research and development uh, approaches DEI. Um, and I've just sort of mapped out on the bottom sort of the, the continuum here of going from grassroots feedback um, to, and listening um, to, to action and, and, and a feedback loop, which, which ultimately leads to continuous improvement. So uh, it was important to put some structure in place around this. And so um, I'm just going to provide on this slide a snapshot of, of how we organized ourselves just last year around diversity and inclusion in process R&D. And so one of the outcomes from these roundtables was sort of the importance of building awareness uh, to topics across the organization. And to do that, uh, we initiated DNI forums and we built a team. Uh, in this case, I'm showing six, the six individuals who are the leads. Um, so two leads across each of three of our larger sites. Uh, and we, you can see the grassroots component um, highlighted in, in the graphic in the middle. And, and each of these uh, pairs of individuals had a small team um, who were tasked with uh, sharing the, the, their wisdom and, and ultimately uh, putting on programming that would, be, that would be distributed to the organization. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Uh, sort of connecting with this group were our 
process R&D DNI team composed of uh, six executive directors, including myself, uh, as well as two HR business partners. And ultimately, I think this group was tasked with setting the, uh, the strategy for, for the department's DNI efforts and then executing on those priorities. Um, at the same time, it's important to, to, to have the sponsorship from the, the, the upper reaches of your organization. And so our sponsors in this case uh, were Mike Kress and Caroline McGregor. So VP level, uh, VP level sponsors um, who were also able to provide us connectivity into broader Merck DNI efforts. Um, and, and you can see it, I've drawn arrows that highlight going sort of from the grassroots forum leads uh, to the PR&D DNI team, to the sponsors. Um, but I think I, I can also draw reverse arrows. Um, so I'm a chemist, so these things are all in equilibrium. Um, and the importance is that both, both ends, of, all, all pieces of this come together, the grassroots all the way up through the sponsorship. And so that's an important recommendation that I would make is that you kind of need the, 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 the entire continuum there. So what are we gonna do? Um, so at the beginning of 2020, we laid out a series of focus areas uh, that included things like improving diverse reputation at all level, uh, representation at all levels within, within the organization, uh, unconscious bias training, uh, resources around flexible work arrangements, which obviously took on a different meaning during the pandemic. Uh, wanted to provide resources around inclusive meeting norms. That was something that certainly came, came out of, uh, came out of our, our roundtables. Uh, but I'm gonna focus on two major buckets, in particular sort of uh, one that's, that focuses on shared experiences um, that bring the, the broader organization together, um, as well as uh, insights discovery training. And so I'm gonna start with the latter. Um, so um, what I should highlight about insights discovery is that is two, th well, there are two things. One, um, despite my championship here, I am not a paid spokesperson. Uh, and two, this is a tool. And so you're not limited to using something like Insights, but we have found it very helpful. And, and the purpose of Insights is to bring organizations or bring people together um, to better understand um, their own as well as others uh, communication styles um, with the idea that this will allow them to connect better with colleagues um, and, and improve collaboration. And, in doing so, they'll have a common language um, that they can utilize to, to highlight what, what sort of their own styles are, as well as understand uh, why different people um, prefer different, different, different styles themselves. So uh, how did we go about this? So in as much as I had heard good things uh, about utilizing insights, uh, I didn't have experience with it. And, and in order to provide that advocacy, the first step we took uh, or was to, was was to, to go through it with my team. So to, to gain that personal experience uh, and it was very favorably received. Um, and, I'll show, and I'll show you on the next slide kind of what that actually looks like. So, so we did that beta testing uh, and then felt it was important to get the executive level sponsorship. So at that point we went through uh, the very same training or similar version uh, with our extended leadership team, which included folks at the VP level, the executive director level and our senior most scientists. Um, once that group was on board, uh, we went and, and sort of enrolled the first line managers uh, before in 2020 rolling it out to our broader organization. Um, so we had to, we ended up doing this virtually last year um, or the, the last bullet, just the broader organization due to the pandemic. Uh, but we found that that has been um, quite effective. Uh, and, and importantly, um, we don't want to exclude uh, new employees from from sort of uh, becoming fluent in the language of insight. So we, we have it set up so that new employees um, are onboarded uh, with, with going through the insights training themselves. So what does this actually look like in reality? Um, so there is an online sort of personality test um, from which each employee receives their personal profile, uh, which includes a page, page and a half of, of of text that is eerily um, on point um, in terms of how you, what you, how you view yourself. Uh, and then that's followed by uh, a two to three hour training on, on the insights pro, uh, program and, and how you might use it. And um, in much like we like to do interviews um, using, we like to do, do structured interviews using the same questions uh, we've been, um, we've managed to, to utilize the same facilitator for all of these sessions. So everyone is sort of being uh, brought up to speed the same way. 
Uh, and finally, it's important that you don't just I mean, go through go through an initial training, um, but then to incorporate um, this in the day to day existence. So whether it's development conversations, team meetings and um, or just monthly tips and tricks, uh, this is sort of part of the vernacular now. And so just two quick visuals. Um, so when you get your profile, you find out what you what what you lead with. Um, so they range from red, um, which is sort of more uh, um, more determined to yellow, which is sociable, green, which is more caring and blue, um, more analytical. And you can see as, as scientists, we have a lot of folks who lead with blue. Um, I myself lead with red. Um, but I think it's been really good for me to, to, to work closely with colleagues who lead with green as I learn to be a leader um, who leads with more vulnerability and, and empathy. And in terms of those monthly tips and tricks, um, this is just a graphic um, that shows how you can structure your meetings um, in order to, to leverage the different, different communication styles, different personality types along the way. Uh, okay. So having talked about insights, now I want to talk about some of the, the sharing efforts we, we, we've we carried out in 2020 into 2021. Um, so revisiting our DNI forum leads, our grassroots effort. Um, again, each of these folks has a, each pair of these folks has a small team at, at three different sites. Um, and, and ultimately they put together seven or eight uh, events um, in 2020 that, that really uh, brought diversity, equity, and inclusion um, to our broader process research and development organization. And so when this started off, these were intended to be by site and in person. Um, and so that was sort of how we operated in February. Uh, everything changed very quickly. Um, and so with that pivot, uh, sort of the first three forums were, were all moved online. Uh, but also were, were all driven by one of the respective sites. Um, and they really, the first three really focused on, on things around COVID-19, um, things like psychological safety, maintaining social connections and fear and empathy. So the mental, the mental health piece uh, of, of sort of how we were working. Uh, I think in the second half of the year, the group really hit its stride um, as they then worked together to assemble fora that, that really touched on contemporary topics um, not that 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 were that were relevant to the broader organization, not by necessarily being the experts themselves, but by working with folks who were who were, who provided that expertise and even came as as guest speakers. And so things in this case by July, um, I think it, it's poignant. We're on we're today is the one year anniversary of of the killing of George Floyd. So we ended up having uh, that July a discussion on Black Lives Matter and fight, fighting systemic racism. Uh, we talked. We had an LGBTQ plus forum. Uh, we talked about the picture of scientist movie and 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 ultimately circled back to the systemic racism question. And so far for 2021, we've we've had one on allyship, and and next month we're going to be talking about working across the generation. So these have been really effective, um, and moreover, sort of our DNI forum leads have taken to uh, providing monthly DNI roundup emails, basically a digest of information. Um, as well as events that are going to be occurring. So uh, May's email focused on Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and so I think just hats off to, to this, this, this team uh, because I think they've really been um, driving um, a lot of what we've done uh, for diversity and inclusion in the organization. Uh, the second uh, sort of sharing event that I want to focus on are some of the TED style talks that we've done. So, so this, uh, this originated as we circulated um, some TED Talks across the DNI team um, that we thought would be valuable to the organization. Uh, but with that, we we started to ask the question of whether there would be valuable value in some of our own team members giving TED style talks about their personal experiences with diversity and inclusion. And uh, we found a really uh, fortunate partner in this. So uh, this Imagine at Merck organization had been created less than a year before and they focus on communication and in fact um, have expert coaches around TED style talks. Um, and uh, they were eager to partner with us on, on this initiative. And so we sent out a back call um, to a thousand person organization and found six uh, brave uh, well, seven brave volunteers um, who are willing to go through um, some pretty intensive training and get out in front of the organization uh, with DNI themed TED Talks. And what we did was we leveraged 
um, town halls by our senior leaders um, as appropriate for a uh, to 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 to, to showcase these TED Talks. So from that first cohort, I just wanted to highlight one. Um, I, I would love to share some of these videos with you. So feel free to re reach out to me uh, offline if you're, if you're interested. But uh, the very first one we did um, was by Drs. Danny Schultz and Mike Pernat. And um, their topic was hidden diversity from the standpoint that they both stutter. Um, and uh, what I will tell you is there was, by the time they were done, there was not a dry eye in the house uh, it really was moving and motivational um, to the organization uh, to to kind of hear how diversity and inclusion really does impact people they know on a day to day basis in ways they might not have been aware of. Um, so building off of the sec success of, of the first cohort, we did do a second cohort of DNI TED Talks. Um, so another half dozen talks. Um, this time we got 12 volunteers. Um, or 12 proposals and, and whittled it down to six. Um, and I've just highlighted um, the individuals, their photos um, and, and the topics here. And, and I'll just sort of go around uh, clockwise um, from the, the lower left. Um, so Alex Pavone um, talked about being uh, sort of some of the challenges he faced uh, growing up uh, Latino and, and that, how that impacted his motivation in STEM. Uh, Chu Hei An talked about a, building a sense of belonging um, and sort of uh, some of the experiences he had uh, growing up uh, as, as Chinese American. Um, Cecilia Bocetia and, and Francois Levesque talked about uh, growing up uh, as non-native English speakers and then coming and working with us and sort of some of the challenges in, in, in language. Uh, T. Fulmer uh, talked about uh, mental health, wellness, uh, as well as um, some of the challenge, some of the, her experiences around Asian American hate. So very timely. Uh, Ji Chi um, joined us from China to talk about influencing with empathy. And Neil Stratman and Ann Mohan talked about, talked about something that we don't normally talk about, religion. And so again, um, these, the outcome here was sort of the sharing of these personal experiences um, has, been incredibly impactful for the organization. Um, I think it's these are roundly um, lauded as some of the most impactful things we've done just by providing that personal connection between folks you know or folks you work with and 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 their DNI experiences. Hey, Rebecca, we need to yep. wrap it up. Great. Okay. Um, so so uh, one thing that's important is that we we don't. Uh, we don't stop uh, our learning here. And so we continue to bring in external speakers um, who are able to provide education to us on different matters around diversity and inclusion. And hopefully they get something out of the experience uh, as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll, on, this, on this next slide, I'll just sort of quickly say, um, much like uh, Dontari's talk, we are interested in continuing to influence the field in terms of representation. And so uh, connecting with folks uh, at, the, at the student level, graduate students, postdocs, um, as well as across, across industry is something that is really important to us. Um, and, and feel free to ask additional questions around that. Uh, and so with that, I'll just thank uh, my, many, my many colleagues um, who, are, who are very committed um, and I think where we've made tremendous progress along those lines and sorry for going long. No problem. Thank you, Rebecca, for a fabulous uh, presentation. In the interest of time, I uh, will move all the questions to the uh, panel session uh, discussion. Uh, so let's move on to the next uh, speaker who is uh, gonna be uh, Dr. Miguel Garcia Garibay. Uh, Miguel Garcia Garibay is a distinguished professor of chemistry and Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Garcia Garibay works to pursue an, adv an advance, uh, a diverse, impartial, and inclusive academic environment at UCLA. Miguel. Um, thank you, Carlos, for the very nice introduction. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Yes, 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 I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, so let me see if I have control of the... Um, I hope I have control of the presentation. Any, anyway, so uh, I want to start by mentioning that my preferred pronouns are he, his, him. I'm delighted to be part of this workshop. I want to thank the Chemical Sciences Roundtable for organizing this very, very important topic. Uh, it's nice for me to be back in the Chemical Sciences Roundtable. I, I was part of the 
uh, of the table, round table for a while. So my presentation is entitled Diversity in All Dimensions, People, Life, Experiences, and Ideas. Uh, but really, the, 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 what we're trying to talk about here is climate, and I think this, all of this is important for climate. So perhaps a good place to start is, uh, let me see, I don't seem to have control of the, okay. Uh, I'm gonna need a little bit of help to advance, I think, for some reason. Okay, there we go. All right, so, you know, so it's, it's, it's probably, uh, you know, uh, important to recognize that there are some advantages to having communities of scholars with common characteristics, backgrounds, languages, and culture who are focused on common scientific endeavors. So some of those advantages include, you know, it's, it'll be easy to challenge each other's results and paradigms. We will share the same uh, jargon. There will be no language barriers, no cultural misunderstandings, no interpersonal tension. And one might say, you know, many things have been done well in that model and, and it works relatively well. We, here we see an image that includes the, a picture of the faculty at MIT in 1900 that includes about 25 Caucasian males and one Caucasian woman. And they were no doubt doing a good job, but perhaps it could have been better, right? You might say, well, you know, that was 1900, so that doesn't happen again. But I actually discovered, and if you can go to the next slide, um, the, the, the next image, uh, which includes, the, that one, that actually includes uh, the illustrious faculty of a chemistry department, probably in the light 80s uh, summer round where there is uh, 25 Caucasian male in the room. So the, the, there is still a, a lot to be gone, even though we're you know, uh, 20 to 30 years later, if we go to the same slide, to the next slide. So uh, I think it's important here that we, we all know that truly impactful scientific advances occur more frequently as a result of a diversified effort with contributions from scholars of different backgrounds, right? So there may be serious barriers to surmount, but the intellectual diversity that comes from exposure to other disciplines, uh, or different jargon, other, other scientific cultures will give scientists an edge. It allows them to establish profitable collaboration and help them establish more creative, uh, you'd be more creative, uh, even when those interactions might have seemed irrelevant uh, or, or even unnecessary. We have here an, an illustration by an image of uh, uh, James Watson, an American biologist and zoologist, and then Francis Crick, a British physicist, who have to combine two disciplines to, to uh, really you know, come up with a, a, a good model for DNA. The one thing that is missing here is we click the next slide is that the diversity required was actually more than that. So we needed a chemist, an X-ray crystallographer, Rosalind Franklin, who brought a different perspective. But as we know, history tells us that there were tensions between them. And, and so that, you know, that it was, it was not, not an easy thing for science to advance in this context. If we can go to the next slide. So, you know, uh, we propose that making science more inclusive to all people, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, cultural expression, you know, uh, every, every dimension of diversity. Uh, it is not obvious how we will all contribute, but it's in fact proven in many different contexts that the results uh, are good, that there are in, uh, direct uh, benefits to both science and society. The reason is in part because different people have different life experiences and perspectives that broaden both the range of questions and the means to obtain the answers. Now, interaction across gender, cultural, ethnic, language, accent, abilities, religious difference, etc., can be challenging. They can be as difficult as, as interactions across different disciplines, but their benefits are all worth it. If we click the next slide, what we'll see is that groups of people who have a particular you know, cultural environment need to adjust to be inclusive of people who might not be you know, able to participate in that environment as illustrated in a, in a, in a picture here where some people are, you know, having uh, a, a joint experience with alcohol, but that would exclude people who, who do not consume alcohol. So the next slide. So I wanted to talk about a couple of key concepts that they're all known, but it's probably good to put it in context because it allows me to make a transition. I'm gonna call diversity the representation of a variety of human identities and life experiences. But that means that each and every one contributes to diversity. There is no one who doesn't have their own experience that brings it to the table. Inclusion is about having one's identity understood, respected, and valued. Inclusion is to be welcome and to be given the opportunity to develop our potential. Equity is about achieving fairness by providing people with what they need 
so that they can attain that potential according to their circumstances. And we know that it's, uh, there is a difference between, between equity and equality. Now, if we click next, what we'll see is that there is another important concept that is dignity, the principle that all people have inherent value and should be treated as such. And the next one is justice. And justice pertains fixing system and structures that prevent EDI and violate dignity. Even though we focus on EDI most of the time, it turns out that dignity and justice are so personal that no matter who you are, you believe in those two things. And they really, if we click next, they will really develop the framework that academic institutions and we as society take to address EDI. In the next slide, we see that uh, universities, which play the role of both educational entities and employers, have the obligation to comply with civil rights compliance. So civil rights has taken a centerpiece in everything that universities do, because that is the right thing to do, no question about that. We need to protect you know, the dignity of, of, of our students, our employees, and ourselves, uh, and we need to be just. And so there is all these different items that need to be looked at, affirmative action, Title IX, ADA, uh, and, and we all are aware of that, but this creates a framework for a university that is a little complex, as we can see in the next slide. The complex is very prescriptive, is, 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 uh, you know, uh, is uh, defined by the law, and universities adopted as their policies. Uh, so the law prohibits discrimination, harassment, and retaliation based on certain protected categories. So there is race, ethnicity, and color, and the list goes on and on, right? Medical condition, genetic predisposition, and so on. So these are pre-described, and there are other uh, you know, characteristics that might not be protected under the law, but are important to consider. If we go to the next slide, what we will find is that what this does, it, it, it makes institutions like universities and others to really take a very, you know, a very detailed approach at, at dealing with conflict. So if there are claims by students, faculty or staff, who is the claim addressed to? Is it to the staff? Is it to the student? Is it to people? And each of those is covered by a particular uh, a portion of, uh, of the civil rights laws. This creates a very complex infrastructure that turns out is going to be extremely expensive. And what we've seen is that as we see here in, in, in a plot, we see the, the, the growth in the number of Title IX investigations that reach the federal level. Uh, these are continuing to increase, and rightly so, right? Because this needs to, this needs to be known. In fact, many of these uh, reports are, many of these statistics are underreported. So if we, if we go to the next slide, what we will see is that being reactive, and only because it is the law, it is expensive, it's confrontational, it's toxic, it's wrong, because it doesn't cover everything that we need to cover. If we go to the next slide, what we see is that we need to be proactive. We need to change the climate, right? So let, let us try to define the, the uh, find a definition of a climate. So the university or department's uh, EDI climate can be defined as the current attitudes, behaviors, and standards of faculty, staff, administrator, and students concerning the level of respect for individual needs, abilities, and potential. It includes the experience of individuals and groups on the campus or the department or the research group, and the quality and extent of interactions between those various groups and individuals, right? If we go to the next slide, we can recognize from these two figures, here we have two images, and the top image there is, there is someone violating the dignity of somebody else what you know is that that makes everybody uncomfortable. Not only is that one person being affected, but the whole environment is, is, is being poisoned when you have people like that. You see when the interactions are productive and constructive, as we see in the bottom slide, you feel comfortable, everybody can go to work and, and things happen well. So if we go to the next slide, what we will find is that uh, in fact, even though we focus a lot of, uh, on, on, on compliance, which is based on civil rights, uh, uh, you know, uh, laws and are basically dignity, respect, and access and freedom. There are many other aspects, other other forms of human behavior that could create a good climate, including understanding, consideration, appreciation, empathy, value, kindness, support, and so on. So not not everything that is right in terms of civil rights is part of a good climate, and vice versa. There are some aspects of the civil right compliance that are very prescriptive and really they don't, do not contribute to a good climate. They just contribute to, to, to the law being followed and it could it, and, and can generate a confrontational situation. So in the next slide, 
we go into, you know, what we need in t- then is, is for organizations, organizations such as universities, departments, and research groups to think about a transformational change, to change from compliance to a good climate. And a possible approach may include many different, you know, uh, uh, approaches. Uh, we need data, don't there? Uh, you just show us that. Right? We need a current climate based on data. Actions must be based on evidence. We need a change in leadership style. We need a clear, consistent commitment to EDI, not only by the, by the leadership, but by all centers of power, right? All of us have some power over, over somebody else, and we need to be cognizant of that and, and be respectful of those who uh, fall under our power. Build trust. Uh, through accountability and transparency, consistent messaging, educate campus communities in relevant aspects of human behavior. We need to learn about social sciences, shift from carrots and sticks approaches to acculturation, and more importantly, promote human connections and and, and relationship building. So with the right guidance and leadership, people will change one another. So if we click, what we'll see is now that uh, uh, I will transition in, in, in a, something that is very, very personal that I've, I've had experience on, and we will get on to the next slide. That will describe my personal perspective on, on uh, EDI climate. So I, I should share with you that I was hired at UCLA in 1992. I was the only Hispanic in the faculty in the chemistry department about, out of about 50. and one of two Hispanic in the physical sciences out of about 200. Rafael Ortiz here in the picture, uh, he was a PhD student in the department. He was one of two or three Hispanic students. He graduated in 1993. He went to do a a postdoc at Caltech. He went to work at Procter & Gamble. And by 2005, he came to give a seminar. And in the audience, he noticed that there there was a a significant number of uh, Hispanic students in the audience. And by that, I mean probably about five or seven or eight. And, you know, after his seminar, he told me, well, you know, diversity wise things have certainly changed a lot. You know, what can I do to help? So he had something in mind. So we, we brainstormed about it and, and we thought, well, can we help change the climate that is change the faculty and students uh, attitudes? And if we go to the next slide, what we see is, uh, I, I should comment, right? So why could this be of interest to Raphael and Procter and & Gamble? Well, the most obvious, uh, you know, thing to think about is they want to recruit uh, a diverse workforce, but also just as importantly, if we click next, what we will see is that, of course, they want to type into the buying power of the U.S. Hispanic population, which by today is more than $2 trillion. So it, it is just a smart business decision and is the right thing to do. In the next slide, what we will see is that our approach, which is uh, uh, presented here and was developed in consultation with a group of UN grad students, so it goes as follows. So our, our goal was to change the climate in the UCLA Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. The means to do that would be by empowering, empowering students. So Raphael and Procter & Gamble gave us $10,000 per year for 10 years between 2005 and 2015 to establish this, uh, this program. So we let the students manage their funds. We help them develop a strong network. We help students make professional contacts. We help them prepare a strong portfolio. Now the strategy, the first item is really important. We will have the group of students invite influential URM and female role models for departmental seminars. And they will celebrate not only their science, but also their identities. They will interact extensively with the speakers during a reception and meals. Uh, so they had the resources to throw a, basically a, a large reception, invite all the department, and it was a very nice social occasion. Now, the second part of the strategy, which I have here in, in red, is the mo- probably just as important, if not the most important. The strategy would be to be 100% inclusive, inv- invite everyone, including Caucasian males and international students, and everyone who cares about diversity. Organize social events, celebrate holidays. Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Cinco de Mayo, Holy, St. Patrick's, Chinese New Year, etc. So celebrate diversity and then promote leadership and community engagement among them, reaching out to K-12 schools and community colleges. So in the next slide, what we will see is that this is a picture of the very first group of students. This picture was taken in 2006, uh, but this is the group that helped us develop this process. And that I just wanna say that this is a remarkable group of people who have been extremely successful, as you will see soon. 
in the next slide, what we will find is that this is a picture of the Organic Student for Cultural Diversity in Science, which is what the, this group is called. Uh, this picture was taken by, uh, in about 2018, and you can see their Twitter, Twitter handle on top if you want to check it out. It's interesting. Hey, Miguel? To their missions. Yes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Their mission statement tells us uh, the Organization for Cultural Diversity in Science strives to create a welcoming community among graduate students in the sciences with an emphasis on increasing cultural diversity at UCLA. We want to project a positive portrayal of underrepresented groups and allies in the sciences to undergraduate, graduate students, to academic and scientific community and to the public at, at large. We aim to provide networking, outreach, professional development opportunities to our members. So this is all about climate, you know? If we go to the next slide, uh, we can, we can, this is from their website and you can see the, the, the website on top there. And they write, professors are invited by the graduate student members based on their scientific success and status as traditionally underrepresented minority to give a research seminar and a diversity seminar at UCLA. The addition of a diversity talk gives the speaker a unique opportunity to describe their journey to, to, to professorship and any unique hurdles that they may have overcome to arrive at their present position. This program has brought over 40 professors to UCLA and continues to be one of the most successful seminars attended by faculty and students. In the next slide, what we see a, a, a sample of a, a representation of the uh, Organization for Cultural Diversity in the Science uh, lecture series programs through the years. What you see here is th this is a constellation of science stars who also happen to identify themselves as, as uh, diversity scientists. We started with uh, Nacho Tinoco from Berkeley, then we had Sam Stuck, Tito Brunia, Eric Jacobson. So, so many people who really have developed an incredible credibility and have had an incredible impact in science so that it, our a whole community understood, you know, that uh, there is a tremendous amount of credibility that can be developed, uh, whether or not you are an uh, underrepresented minority. If we click next, what we'll see is that in the next, uh, the, the two most recent speakers was, uh, you know, uh, on May 3rd, 2021, we had Professor Marquita del Carpio Landry from UC Berkeley. And if we click next, on, uh, we'll see that on, on May uh, 18, uh, we had Professor Rodney Priestley uh, from Princeton. And if we click next, we can see that as part of the professional development, the, the student organization actually has uh, uh, student seminars. And here we see a seminars by Marco Messina, who's now a UC Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow in Professor Christopher Chang Lab at Berkeley. And he is basically gonna be looking for a job. So keep an eye on him. In the next slide, we'll see that. So where are, where are those students now? So what we see here is a, is a small collage with a, a representation where Luis Campos, Adam Branschweig, and Marino Resendiz, and Diana Azurdia were part of the original group that developed the concept of the Organization for Cultural Diversity. Uh, Steve Lopez, now at Northeastern, and Fernando Uribe Romo at Central Florida are uh, later alums. And if we click next, this trend has, has followed. So most recently, the University of Southern California here in Los Angeles announced that they were hiring another member of this organization, uh, Dr. Elias Picasso, who will join the ranks uh, in 2022 after finishing a postdoc with Eric Jacobson. If we go to the next slide then, uh, I wanna give a shout out to Steve Lopez and another, another of one of the members of the group, Crystal Valdez, who, you know, they're so motivated and the level of leadership is so high that they created the Alliance for Diversity in Science and Engineering to, in other words, bring the concepts and ideas of the, that they developed at UCLA into the national level. And this is a very exciting development. In, the, in my last slide, we can see that, well, has the climate has changed in the Department of Chemistry at UCLA? I think it would be for me preposterous to say that there is a you know, cause-effect uh, relation here. Now, nonetheless, what you see here are the photographs and names of some incredibly amazing young scientists that have been, hiring, have been hired at UCLA during the time that the Organization for Cultural Diversity in Science has existed. I think this is a very diverse group. Uh, not, it's not only a diverse group, this, these are world leaders in their disciplines. And if you see here, this group is not particularly gender balanced, but in 2021, the department has offers out to three women, one of whom has already accepted. 
So I guess I can conclude by, by, by uh, in the next slide by just uh, indicating that, you know, a transformational organizational change for EDI from government dictated compliance to good climate is important, will reduce the amount of conflict, has the potential of saving a great deal of money, not only in compliance infrastructure, but a good climate lead to faculty and staff retention. It will give us a better and just work environment and a better standard of living. Now, a lot of this has to be done at the level of uh, you know, the, the dean, the president, the chair of the department, but there are many, many things that even uh, someone, uh, a faculty member like I was when, when I started this group can really have a significant impact. If we want to change the EDI climate, we need to change leadership styles and the people in the organization. And we, to do, and we need to do that. Uh, to do that, we need to be smart and intentional. And I think that summarizes my message. I think the outlook is, is, is amazing. And I'm very, very warm by everything that I'm hearing today and by seeing where our community is going. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miguel, for a very nice presentation. And uh, I got to just say that uh, I was one of those that really was happy to learn when you made it to uh, UCLA a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're my hero. Uh, Thank you, Carlos. So, uh, so Ana Duran has a question. It says, uh, Miguel, all good activities toward changing the climate are very good, but uh, what about contributions to product development and the science? How are contributions tracked and documented? What kind of innovations have occurred? I mean, that is a fantastic question, right? So, so the fact is that uh, what we claim and what the data suggests is a diverse workforce, whether it is you know, in industry or in academia, will have better products. So one of, one of the primary products of a university, of an academic institution, is, is the workforce itself. So the students, the qualified students that will join you know, uh, the highly sophisticated economies that we want to have, they are really what, what you can consider the main product. And our students are going to, do, to, to occupy those jobs and, you know, with, a, with a much higher degree of diversity. Now, if we look at the science that has been produced in the department, I think that doubtlessly, you know, the, the, by, by every uh, analytical method that you use, the department has been doing extremely well. Uh, so I, I think uh, as you look at every dimension of the output of uh, a diverse group of both faculty and students, I think it's easy to document that. I mean, you know, uh, I, I actually think that the ranks of UC, many of the rankings of UCLA have increased over this time period. And I think that's very important. That's what many institutions want to uh, accomplish. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I don't have another question, but I do have a comment uh, from Sabna Sarupriya. That says, uh, absolutely fantastic actions proposed by Dr. Garcia Garibay simple actions like celebrate different holidays. It's fun and inclusive, and you get to eat good food. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, thank you, Miguel, thank you. for a very nice presentation. So we move forward uh, with the next one. So our final speaker of this session will be uh, Dr. Travis York, uh, who is the Director of Inclusive STEM Ecosystems for Equity and Diversity at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. York's research and work focus on catalyzing and sustaining uh, systemic change and transformation to achieve inclusive and equitable access and progress through science, technology, engineering, and mathematics pathways into the STEM workforce. Travis? Thank you, Carlos. And thank you to everybody at uh, the National Academies for um, in, including me in this incredible uh, workshop and, and uh, with these other really great uh, presenters. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, Carlos, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, yep. Yes? Okay, just double checking, great. So uh, first and foremost, again, thank you everybody uh, for, for being here with us today. And uh, thank you to the fellow co-presenters. I have the very lucky task of going third in this panel and I get to um, uh, capitalize on all the wonderful information that's already been shared. Uh, so I get to go, uh, go a little bit quicker in my intro here. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to just uh, 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 share with everybody is that uh, my presentation today, uh, in my presentation today, one of the established programs that I will be sharing about is our Sea Change initiative with at, at the AAAS. Um, and uh, I wanted just to, to briefly honor my colleagues at AAAS. So 
on the screen here, um, I, I did want to share uh, some of my other team members within ICED and that lead the Sea Change Initiative uh, because it's uh, this this work that I'll be sharing is certainly um, uh, part of their genius and part of their hard work as well. And so I just want to acknowledge them. As we think about the the problem here, is to talk a little bit about um, you. Uh, uh, this issue around how faculty are so important in this broadening our view around DEI and chemical sciences, and in particular about how uh, building a more inclusive and diverse STEM faculty is so important really to all of those rungs uh, that Dorian shared with us at the very beginning of this, of, of this panel. Um, and really thinking about how both diversification of faculty uh, support all students. It's hard to be what you cannot see but there's also a building a more inclusive faculty so that all STEM faculty are more inclusive to support inclusive pedagogy, inclusive advising, inclusive research mentoring, and how important it is for organizations to really think about institutions of higher education as organizations to think about their roles in really uh, developing a more inclusive and diverse STEM faculty. So um, I think you're already a little bit aware of uh, Dr. Urbowski nicely shared with us that there are there is progress that we are making in the area of diversifying uh, faculty, but the students that we serve in higher education are far outpacing the diversification that we do see in faculty. And that persists into all other areas, not just undergraduate students, into graduate students, uh, for faculty, but also in industry. And so there are growing and growing concerns um, that we're, we're, you know, my question is always, uh, will our institutions be ready for the students that they are serving? And um, I have some concerns about uh, how our structures are prepared to do that. Um, another look at this data. So uh, one of the reasons I really love this work by Lee and uh, Codell is uh, what you see here are two, two kind of numbers for each racial category and gender category in disciplines. And that first number that you see, this is from a subset of the top 50 universities, um, uh, uh, top 50 research universities in the US. And that first number that you see is actually the percentage of degree producers for PhDs. So the percentage or market share of PhDs produced by that subgroup in that discipline. And the second number that you see in brackets is a corresponding percentage or market share of assistant faculty, assistant professors. So in theory, what we would, would imagine that we would see in a well-operating system is that in these percentages, in these market shares, that a similar proportion or makeup of at least the students graduating with their PhDs, that we would see those demographic kind of proportions mirrored into the that are Hey, Travis, I think you're breaking up. Academic careers. Carlos, can you hear me? I think I'm back. Yeah, you're back. Nice. Thank you. I, I don't know where I quite cut off. Uh, so uh, what I was talking about here is just a kind of uh, a quick kind of look here at how the representation that we see uh, for, for uh, degree in degree production does not follow into a, uh, academic faculty. So um, I'm going to keep going there. Apologies again for, for the disruption, but uh, I want to make sure that we're uh, moving in our time still. Perfect. Okay. And so this, this mismatch in representation, we can see that this happens, you know, across all areas and across uh, all, all, all disciplines in the science and engineering workforce, and really by all of these underrepresented areas. So Here's an, a really nice demographic just for a uh, figure, just kind of showing both in, in, in gender and in race, the kind of flip-flopping that we see occur um, here. I'm gonna continue going to kind of make up some extra time. So, so part of what I wanna share here is that, you know, I, I've been working on this issue for a little over a decade at this point in time. And I think part of the issues that I have um, kind of come in contact with really regularly is that I think that there's an issue around the existing conversations um, and really about the existing conversations to challenges uh, to increase faculty. Oftentimes I hear three prominent items. One, it's a pipeline problem. The number of people uh, uh, graduating from underrepresented groups is just too small. 
I've heard faculty and pro or presidents and provosts say we, we, there's just not enough people for us to hire. That is an issue in some areas, but it's not the full issue. The other issue that I commonly hear is that it's a hiring problem, that there's implicit bias or lack of effort um, or lack of a commitment from an institution to just hire, that the, the candidates are there and they're not being hired, which some of the previous data that we just saw would, would confirm. And then the third thing that I oftentimes hear institutional leaders talk about is the revolving door problem, that it's a retention issue, that faculty from underrepresented groups are less likely to get tenure and they're more likely to leave, uh, that perhaps there's not critical mass and so they don't feel a great sense of belonging in the academy. I think one of the biggest issues is thinking about this conversation in these subsets or sub conversations and not actually thinking about it in a holistic approach. And so why hasn't the needle moved? Well, it's because of that bifurcation of these conversations. And these challenges are oftentimes assumed to be due to kind of individual will and ability outside of an institution's control. And I think that that's a real issue. Um, in fact, if we think about these issues as being only a product of individual will, it kind of absolves institutional leaders, institutional actors. And by the way, when I say institutional leaders, I'm not just speaking about senior institutional leaders with, with kind of formal authority. I'm speaking about kind of all leaders and in institutions. And so this kind of promulgation, I think, really leads to making it less about an, in, an institution and more about an individual. And that's what really what we seek to do at AAAS, in particular with our initiative around sea change, is we really try to think about this not as about an individual commitment, but about an institutional commitment. And we really think about this as moving from soft-funded programs, strategies, implementations into hard-funded institutional structural reformation. So um, the problem that I think we see here when we are thinking about these in isolated categories and disconnected is that we tend to, uh, institutions tend to think about strategies they can employ. And strategies are very important. I don't wanna be um, uh, confused here, but strategies around individuals are a necessary but incomplete part of this puzzle. And this is not just uh, supported by us, uh, or this is not, what I'm saying is not new. I wanna pay homage to the many NASOM um, publications that have really specifically spoken about the need for structural and systems change and uh, transformation. Um, this quote, by the way, is out of the most recent sexual harassment um, uh, uh, consensus study for women in science. And here, in fact, uh, there is actually recommendations made around the project that I'm going, going to be talking about and how important it is for institutions to not just think about strategies and, uh, and um, uh, single implementations or even suites of strategies, but to really think about organizational and structural change. Um, and I wanna stress that this is a both and. Those programs are really, really important, uh, but they help individuals guide systems. And when the system is not working for more than half of the students that it is supposed to be working for, the system is broken. And so at this point in time, institutions of higher education are serving more underrepresented, it's really historically underrepresented groups, than they are serving majority groups. And so they are the global majority. And if our systems are not working for those students, there's a really profound issue with those systems. So we have to evolve those systems to do what they're intended to do. And that's what we really focus in on with C change. So C change stands for the STEM equity and uh, uh, STEM equity achievement uh, change program. It's an initiative that we launched in 2018. Um, we started it in 2017 and really launched in 2018. And C change really provides the scaffolding or a system. It really provides kind of a process to guide institutions of higher education through context specific and voluntary change. I really think about this as the ways that we empower the people at institutions to use their context expertise to really understand what problems they're facing, how to build action plans that are responsive to their context and to the research that's available, and then make evidence-based action plans to enact change and really sustain that change on their campuses. And this change that we're after is completely around transforming organizations of higher education to better support 
more, uh, more diverse STEM faculty and in particular also more inclusive STEM faculty. So uh, our program operates within the context of the United States and we really focus on intersectionality uh, within our program. I'll talk a little bit more about the key uh, pieces there. One of the key approaches that we take within our sea change initiative is really borrowing on ecological sciences. We use Brenner's kind of ecological approach. And here you see, you can see in this kind of figure here, I, I, this is my interpretation of kind of some of the ways that I apply Brenner's approach uh, in thinking about the kind of different types of systems that make up an institution of higher education. And what we find, especially when, we're, when we talk about kind of the, re, the recruitment, hiring and retention of faculty, many of those structures exist at the mesosystem and exosystem. And these structures also have many, many points of what Carrie and O'Mara calls um, institutional discretion, where people, individuals are making decisions, um, sometimes with or without systemic equity checks to support uh, how those decisions are made. This is where sometimes people talk about implicit bias coming in for say a faculty hiring committee. Um, and so we think about these kind of discretionary spaces and we think about that, in, really, in reality, there are two primary ways that we can encourage inclusive and equitable decision-making. One is through the development of individual's capacity. That's where a program like implicit bias training might help faculty understand how bias can play in, might help safeguard their, that from happening in their own decision-making. But that again is focusing on individuals. The second though, is developing the capacity of organizations. And this is what I call equity system checks. There are in fact in uh, processes and practices and structures that we can put in place to support individuals' capacity as well. Um, and so that, those are structural spaces where you might kind of change the process in which uh, uh, faculty are hired or faculty are recruited across an entire system to make sure that it's equitable and to make sure that there are checks to make sure that institutions and actors are making decisions in line with the values that they hold for the institution. We use a model developed by Kimberly Griffin to really think about recruitment, hiring, transition, and retention of faculty in a more holistic way. Um, and this, instead of, as you heard me talk about earlier, instead of thinking about these in isolated spaces, we really focus on doing this holistically. And then finally, Real, real change does require a long-term commitment. So uh, as institutions choose, choose to join Sea change uh, which there isn't a designation kind of process, a peer review designation process within Sea change institutions are required to uh, have regular reporting where they provide data and where, that, uh, where the progress that they are making towards their goals are reviewed by uh, professionals in the field to maintain the designations that they get. So if an institution becomes a bronze awardee, um, they have regular intervals where they have to continue to show their progress towards making change uh, be because it really does require a long-term commitment. Five minutes, Travis. Thank you. Also, uh, part of what we do to kind of really catalyze change is we help institutional leaders think about common change traps. So having worked with institutional leaders, provosts, presidents, uh, deans, department chairs for over a decade, we've come to learn a lot of the change traps that people commonly fall into. For instance, jumping from awareness right into implementation without doing kind of root cause analysis to really understand what your institution's data is telling you about where common problems are and what is going on there. So we really work to, to build institutional leaders understanding of change processes. And then finally, I would just kind of note that this isn't news. Um, uh, what part of what uh, my, my le learning and lessons uh, here have actually been seen in other research studies. So a recent study by um, Larson and Austin found uh, specifically of advanced institutions found that uh, there is no silver bullet, that best practices um, actually have mixed results across institutions. Um, this, this study was done specifically on trying to increase gender equity. And so we really have to think about a holistic and systems approach. And part of the way that we do this with institutions is thinking about um, action plans that really involve four frames. And so this is a four, the image I have on the screen here is the four frames um, model for creating inclusive organizations. And we think about action plans that need to cover every quadrant of, of these um, kind of four areas here. 
What does that mean in particular for sea change? So there are a couple key considerations. One, I had mentioned earlier that we really focus on intersectionality. We, in focus, we really focus, as a, a, a history of research has shown here, on the intersections of race and gender and LGBTQI status and veteran status and persons with disability status. And we help institutions really dig into their data to find the hidden figures there um, and to really kind of understand um, many institutions come to us and say, we actually don't have a lot of the data that you're asking us to give. Uh, and we under we actually, we, we say, yes, we understand that. That's something that we need to work with you to help you understand what the, the reality of your campus really looks like. The other thing that we look at is differentiation across STEM fields. STEM fields are, are not all alike. And so being context dependent requires us to think about that. And then finally, another really important, uh, next to last, another really important uh, consideration here is that we have a very intentional focus on legal considerations. It is extremely important that in today's um, uh, climate and in today's uh, uh, political and uh, statewide kind of environments that institutions understand the legal ramifications of the work they're doing and that they gather the appropriate data to make appropriate cases for the uh, actions that they are taking and how those actions support the mission that they are trying to achieve. And so we work with Education Council and other partners to really ensure that they, uh, the, the capacities that we're building have this legal framing. Um, and finally, we co-construct all that we do with institutions. So what is Sea Change? We have three pillars. The first pillar is our community, uh, which is really uh, uh, kind of working with institutions around moderated conversations, communities of practices and convenings. We're launching on June 1st, our port of call, which is a virtual space. Uh, we also have uh, the second kind of pillar of our, of our uh, program is called the Institute. We provide training to our Sea Change members and to non Sea Change members, if any of you are interested. We provide trainings really to build the capacity of leaders doing this work and of these organizations. Uh, so there's three examples here around building gender equity, uh, diversity in the law and talking about leaving the visited. And then finally, sea change is also this kind of awards or designation process. So as I mentioned, we actually have three levels of awards. We have a bronze award, a silver award, and a gold award. The bronze award is really about institutions doing the work to understand the issues they're having and then co-constructing an action plan to move towards building a more equitable institutional structure. To get a silver award, institutions must demonstrate progress to that award. And then gold awards are really kind of what I think about as a, a lighthouse, a beacon in the field where institutions are actually supporting other institutions and other change throughout the STEM ecosystem. All of these awards are um, peer reviewed. They're not chosen by us, um, but uh, we have uh, a pan panels of peer reviewers that work in this. And then finally, Sea Change also works at a top down, bottom up space. So while we do institutional awards, we're actually in the process of piloting several other departmental awards where we're actually working with professional societies to co-create the, the, the guidelines, the policies, and the standards that would denote these awards. So a similar awards process. And we really folk, uh, uh, harness these uh, awards at the institutional and at the department level in a way that allows institutions to uh, pull each, uh, the, the both kind of zoom in and out between the institutional and departmental level in the ways that institutions can travel along this path. And then finally, we are also just uh, piloting work within the biomedicine awards uh, to really help academic health centers and medical colleges and thinking about how they also uh, become more inclusive in their processes. So not just traditional uh, institutions of higher education, but also other areas so that we can take a full systems approach. Here are some future directions that we're heading into. As I mentioned, we're piloting lots of new areas within, uh, within Sea Change, and we're also uh, moving into more and more institutions and more areas. Um, and then finally, we're looking forward to adapting this framework also within the uh, two-year college space uh, within the next five years. So that wraps up my, uh, my presentation right here around Sea Change. And I just also want to give gratitude not only for all of you listening, but also to our funders in this space. And I'm happy to take questions in the time that remains. Uh, thank you very much, Travis. Uh, we have uh, time for a couple of questions, uh, clarifying questions. I have one here from... Uh, Linda Nunn, uh, essentially she asks, how is the data treating domestic versus international students? 
That's a great question. So in our data and working with sea change institutions, we actually do break out international versus domestic students. This is also really important for faculty. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of research that has shown that there is a different effect that diverse faculty, whether they're domestically diverse or international, have upon um, halo effects of the students they serve. And that in fact, increasing also the, the underrepresented faculty that are domestic underrepresented faculty have a differential and more positive effect for domestic underrepresented students. So we actually work with our institutions to track these separately so that they can get at these evidence bases. Thank you. There is one more from Anna Duran. Uh, yeah. She actually says, uh, Travis, one of the issues creating uh, change traps is that usually DEI training education lasts for a couple of days, one day or yeah. two. And in most cases, uh, there is no transfer of learning. Okay, processes designed to make sure that the DEI concepts can be soft and shaded. Uh, what can be done to improve learning processes? Absolutely. I mean, Anna just hit it on the head as far as um, we need to pay attention to the massive amounts of pedagogical research that our own institutions oftentimes are producing around how we change uh, and, or how we build the capacity of individuals on our campus to really become more inclusive, to understand diversity training. Um, there's a, a great article a few weeks ago in the New York Times about this specifically related to industry. Um, a one-off training is just bad teaching theory, right? It's, it, this is the, the social sciences have actually made a lot of work. I, I am a social scientist by training, very happy to be accepted among the STEM colleagues that I have. Um, and and this, is, this is exactly uh, the, the point that what we have to do around building the capacity of individuals is to think about long-term systemic growth. And so um, for faculty, for staff, for students, institutions need to think about professional development plans that include increasing capacity, awareness, and knowledge over the course of a career for a person at an institution. So for faculty, this is about their training and their development across their lifetime, um, similar for institutional leaders. And I would say this is also really, really important for governing boards, boards of trustees, uh, you know, boards of, of, of visitors, depending on what your institution have. It's vitally important that our boards are also being trained and building their capacities, especially because most board members outlast presidents and provosts. And so when these board members understand the mission, uh, the reason that diversity, equity, inclusion is a primary consequence for the success of the US talent pool, for the, it is a morally correct thing to do, um, and all of these other imperatives, they can help guide the, uh, the institution for this not being a person's uh, kind of pet project and more thinking about how this is a part of the institution's DNA. This is a part of who they are and maintain this long-term commitment. All right, thank you very much. I think uh, with that, uh, we're ready to move to our uh, panel discussion session. Uh, so all our uh, presenters are gonna be part of the panel. And uh, so we have some of the, your questions already uh, that you have been sending to us, I have some of those here, and I will try to ask him, uh, provided the time. And uh, but keep uh, you know keep asking. These guys are here to answer your questions. Okay, so uh, with that, I will use my uh, prerogative as a uh, organizer or co-organizer, and I'm gonna ask you a question for the panel. Uh, so I think it was mentioned in a couple of the talks uh, the issue of conversations, the need to have a honest conversations, right? Now, in reality, that poses a lot of problems, right? Uh, so how do you have these tough conversations with people so you can actually nurture the right environment to lead to a, you know, DI, uh, uh, you know, re uh, the versatile uh, environment, okay? So the question for, for you guys is, how do we do that? How do we actually make sure that we have a safe haven for people that might have opposite views about these issues? So they can start talking to each other, they can start understanding each other. Any takers? I, I, I guess I can, I, can, I can take it, I can start. So, you know, we have an experience uh, in the UCLA campus uh, and, and a collaboration with the, the STEM uh, fields, but particularly the life sciences and the physical sciences. We, we've been having a, a, a yearly workshop 
uh, is an experiential, experiential workshop that brings together about 40 faculty from all departments who, who have a conversation about difficult topics, right? Uh, about, you know, uh, implicit bias, uh, you know, uh, uh, imposter syndrome, uh, things of that sort, and, and trying to understand the perspective of the students. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, it, it, it is uh, because you have a conversation in a setting that is kind of, uh, you know, is, is guided, but, but it's, uh, it's a safe space. So it is an opportunity for people who have not been exposed to it to, to learn about it. So, you know, the, the general thesis is that scientists are really smart people who, so, who mean well, but sometimes miss the target for whatever reason, right? So, so then the, the, the question is, if, if that assumption is correct, that means with a, a certain amount of information, you can create an, a, the framework where people who are well-intentioned do not miss the target, right? So, and, and that, that comes with information and knowledge. And, and again, you know, um, that knowledge often comes from the, from the social sciences because science is, a, is, a, is, a, is an endeavor that involves a lot of interactions and, and hierarchies, things that, that we are not particularly well trained to. But if, once we are exposed to it, I think we are more likely to understand all of that. So by doing it in, a, in, a, in an environment that is a safe environment and having many different perspectives and having a, a, a discussion again that is based on data, we, we, are, we accept data, most scientists accept data, right? And, and that helps a lot, that's, in, in, that's what I've seen. Yeah, so I, I think uh, the, the, the question I was actually, go, go ahead, Travis, and now I'll, I'll finish. Yeah, sure, I, I was just gonna add to that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is a, a really important question, right? I mean, I think right now we're, we're um, you know, Americans find themselves in particular in a space where we have a lot of polarization in, in, in our country. And that polarization is on our campuses and in our families and uh, all, over the, all over the place. Um, and so I think it's, you know, it's a really important thing for us to attend to, especially those of us, you know, who are really committed to DEI to think about, you know, how does DEI not become a partisan, a partisan issue? And how does it, how does it become you know, how do we make sure that we're making efforts to build a more inclusive, um, a more inclusive culture, a more inclusive society? Part of the the values that that all of that all Americans have and that all per persons might have. And so, I think part of that is really approaching uh, DEI as um, a journey, and in in particular creating space, you know, I think we have to create space for people to make mistakes. Um, and and uh, because it's it's when people are fearful of making mistakes, when they're fearful of, of kind of the repercussions that they oftentimes, you know, won't, won't feel comfortable to grow and they won't, or they'll feel so uncomfortable being uncomfortable that, that it doesn't work, right? So I think we have to approach these topics from, from this kind of space of creating a learning dyna dynamic really thinking about inclusion and equity as a virtue, just like patience. It's something that we continue to work at. It's something that we all can grow in. Um, and then, you know, I think the other, the other space of this is to really think about how, um, you know, institutions of higher education in particular must continue to think about the primary, primary ways in which we educate students and build an engaged citizenry is by developing students um, capacity to critically engage with multiple oftentimes conflicting ideas. And so, you know, right now the big topic I think in the in the news is actually about whether or not institutions should allow critical race theory to be taught. This is to me one of these like huge like wh why would we even question this? Institutions of higher education should absolutely be encountering and helping their students encounter multiple theories, multiple uh, viewpoints so that they can build the skills uh, for how how they contribute to and build knowledge and, and see themselves as agents of building a more just society. Um, and, you know, I'm waiting and willing for the day that students, that, you know, current students build an even better theory than CRT um, and show us, you know, even greater knowledge and, and capacity for us to make improvements in these areas. 
All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, so since this is uh, this question is related to as a follow-up of what you guys have been discussing, uh, I will just post it there. This is uh, from Cindy Lee. And she says, uh, how can you convince colleagues to make contributions to DEI? What arguments can you can be made in a predominantly white institution in the South? I'll start off with some since I'm unmuted, but I welcome the feedback from my colleagues on the panel for sure. So, so it's interesting. There's um, so there's some really interesting research that's come out recently about the differentiation between how uh, people in the majority, white people, respond to uh, messaging around DEI and how persons who are actually underrepresented respond to messaging around DEI. Um, so, for instance, um, white white parents and white students tend to respond very well to kind of economic arguments around the kind of uh, prosperity of the U.S. workforce, you know, there, there is reality here where we're facing a STEM short, uh, shortfall, depending on which researchers are correct that, correct, that all predict a shortfall, how big the shortfall will be, will be the real question. Um, and so we need, we need every single student who's currently coming into STEM to graduate in STEM, and we need more students to come into STEM, right? So there is a kind of workforce economic imperative um, that tends to work really well with industry leaders, with, with um, other faculty, uh, people in the majority. Um, and there's also this uh, ethical imperative that actually um, Black and Latino families and Black and Latino parents tend to respond much better to. I think that there's some research that's recently shown that this is in part because of wanting to ensure that their children are truly honored and respected at the institutions they go to. And that imperative question is much more based around the idea, idea that be, creating inclusive and equitable environments are just the right thing to do. That being inclusive of all people is a, a fairness and a justice aspect. Um, but I think there's also a couple other imperatives that are important here. So there's the economic, there's the moral imperative. But I think the other one that's really important in particular for STEM researchers and faculty is a lot of the research around the diversity of team science, the science of team science, which has really clearly shown us that diverse teams of people from multiple backgrounds and diverse perspectives do better science. They, they are better at getting funding, they're better at creating problems to, uh, sorry, creating uh, 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 solutions to problems that are more inclusive and have a bigger impact in society. Um, and those teams also tend to do their work more quickly and more effectively. So it's really kind of the, 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 the argument for me around the science is it's just better science. Uh, and I think that that goes very far with other STEM faculty. M Miguel, Rebecca, I'd love to hear your perspectives on this. I, I can add something relatively brief. So in academic institutions like mine, uh, contributions to EDI by all faculty are required as part of the promotion uh, uh, and review process. So, you know, it's a top-down approach. Leadership demands that. But the definition of contributions to diversity can be very broad. I think the, the intention here is more to have everybody be thoughtful about it, put it in their mind, and, and then, you know, some, some of us contribute much more and some people will contribute much less. But everybody needs to have a statement and I think you know that that's helping change the climate in, in a global perspective. So that's just one of the many potential approaches. Yeah, I think for, from my perspective, sorry, my uh, my my Zoom had dropped. I'm back. Uh, but uh, I, I think I think this concept of allyship is really important, um, and especially from the standpoint that you know most of most of our leaders, most of our decision makers fall into the the in the, that in group, which doesn't include, um, you know, diverse diverse representation, and so so building that 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 allyship um, is is absolutely critical. And so I think that's that's the centerpiece of that is uh, building awareness of what the issues are, uh, making it actionable, um, and understanding the importance of of sponsorship. And so you know, I think I, I spoke about. Uh, sort of the reverse mentorship that myself and a colleague did for members of our senior leadership team. Um, and, and I think that that proved transformative. It could have backfired. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that, you know, talking to somebody a couple levels above you in the organization and trying to educate them uh, and, and do it in a way that doesn't torpedo your career uh, 
can be can be very challenging, but uh, but ultimately um, incredibly meaningful. And so, if you're willing to sort of take that plunge, uh, I think I I think it can be really impactful. I think beyond that, I think just the general emphasis on allyship and the benefits to your teams and your organization is something that that can't be emphasized enough. And so, finding fora that that allow you to talk about the importance of allyship um, and bring bring those in the in-group into the conversation is absolutely critical. There's some, Thank you. some really great chat Go going on in the q and I'm just pointing out uh, some, some really wonderful, um, some like contributions to this conversation in the, in the Q&A. Thank you. And uh, for you guys, uh, feel free to actually pick one of the questions and answer if you want. Okay, so that's, that's fine. But uh, I have one here. Uh, so, this is from Faith Morrison, and uh, she asks, can the speakers comment on the backslash against unconscious bias training? I can start on this one. I, th I think Travis actually um, provided a, a, a really meaningful answer for this question uh, when he was talking about, about training in general, right? It, the problem with most unconscious bias trainings is that they end up being one-offs. And so you give the appearance that you care about something, uh, and then and then there's no follow up, and so uh, so it almost puts you in a worse position uh, than than from where you started. And so uh, so I think unconscious bias training itself is incredibly valuable and incredibly impactful for building awareness, uh, but I think it needs to be a part of a continuous dialogue. And so if there's a training, you need to find group meetings or, or smaller settings to continue that conversation, provide resources uh, to ensure that, that, that we're still talking about it and that it's not just that, that one hit wonder, so to speak. I, I would add that you know, implicit bias is one of those topics that has been broadly documented scholarly and it can be proven really easily. So I think anybody who questions uh, implicit bias just really hasn't taken the time to look at it. The evidence is overwhelming, and any one of us can do it. You know, through the uh, what I don't remember the name of the of the website thing is uh, explicit or implicit. Yeah. Right. So so it's just not not debate. I think to say that implicit bias is is not real or it's not important is just being uh, uninformed. Yeah, project implicit. Um, yeah, it's really, really great. I, I think some of the backlash around implicit bias, implicit bias train, not, I don't know if it's as much about the training or just the concept itself is, um, you know, there's there's some debate from the researchers that study implicit bias training about kind of what are effective ways to actually try to mitigate implicit bias. And I think some of that work has has highlighted that it's it's quite difficult to remove implicit bias. And so a lot of the work in DEI has talked about how it, it's, not, it's not necessarily the goal to try to remove implicit bias, but for, for people to be, you know, I think there was this great term in the chat talking about race literacy, for people to understand implicit bias literacy, to understand what biases they may contain, and then to be proactive in um, asking others to check those biases or to kind of seek out alternative ways of thinking or models to try to mitigate that. And, and I think, you know, uh, kind of from a, from a very academic standpoint, um, Keegan's orders of consciousness, I think help give us a framework from which we can draw upon how to mitigate or transcend um, some implicit bias. And not transcending as in you won't have it, but more that um, in Keegan's orders of consciousness talk about how important it is in trying to create new mental constructions in both uh, providing mentorship in that space allowing individuals to um, be coached as they try to think in different ways and to build a bridge into a different kind of mental construction. Um, and to know that, that when you're moving between orders of consciousness, it is quite common for people to do a back and forth as they're really trying to test out new ways of thinking repeatedly over time. So it's not, again, it's not the one and done. There is no magic bullet. Sorry, I'm muted, sorry. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, from Samuela Sigman, uh, she asked, uh, one very frustrating aspect of being faculty and staff in academia is our inability to interact with administrators. Communicating the, uh, with those at the decision-making level is nearly impossible. 
to have the top down, I mean, the top down button up approach, how can we start to address the limitations for conversations created by you know, a siloed uh, power structure? I feel like Miguel probably has some good examples. I, I certainly would be happy to, I'm happy to weigh in on this too. I, I think it's going to depend on the organization, right? And, and uh, the personality of, uh, of the leader of that organization, or the leaders of that organization. So yeah, it, it is obviously desirable that there are direct communication lines uh, to, to leadership, uh, you know, or that there are structures that allow for that communication to flow. Uh, I think, you know, this is something that uh, it should be uh, known to, to the leadership that, that we as a staff or as faculty would like to have that and, and just uh, make it, a, you know, make, making a request about that, I, I, I suppose. There are organizations that are well, already very well structured from that perspective and, and others not. So it's, it's a bit of a continuum. But I think uh, that every voice should be heard. Every contribution, every uh, contribution to a particular problem uh, or <clears throat> providing something to, new to the organization should be known. I think that this is one of the spaces where you know, organizations like Merck, um, you know, Rebecca's slides around kind of mutual feedback loops and listening kind of spaces. That's such a great thing that I think institutions of higher education can, can learn from. Some institutions I think do have mechanisms that are, are helpful here. And I, I, I have, uh, so I'm a recovering faculty member. I was a faculty member before I came into the association world. And um, I've worked at institutions that did this really well. And I've worked at institutions where I felt similarly frustrated, where I was like, there's, there's no way for me to, to help in these situations or to voice concern. So I, I think where I see institutions do this well, there are oftentimes multiple pathways to, to provide voicing. One of the things that I like to encourage faculty members who feel this frustration is to look at their faculty unions or kind of shared governance structures that's oftentimes there is some kind of formal mechanism within a faculty uh, union or representation to allow for some, allow you to navigate some of those spaces. Um, I think uh, some kind of informal ways are that um, more and more institutions, thankfully, are, are really thinking about how they create dedicated change teams. So this is something that we do in Sea Change. We actually advise Team, we advise campuses when they come into a member, one of the first things we do is we help them create a dedicated team. And that team has to have both formal and informal leaders, and it has to have representation across all of the different stakeholders on the campus. Now, the problem you run into here is you can't have an effective any committee, right? We've all been on faculty committees where like, the, if the committee is of a certain size, hardly anything's getting done. Um, so the other thing that we do is we really coach our institutions in thinking about how they leverage feedback and voice from across their faculty, from across positions and departments, um, and how they're going to synthesize and use that information. Um, so we do a lot of work with helping um, institutions understand how they garner that feedback. Um, and, and I think Adriana Kazar has done some really helpful work in this, in this space. That's a helpful scholar. Rebecca? Yeah. I mean, so I'm a, I live in a different world, uh, obviously, by, by virtue of working in, in industry, and there are pluses and minuses to that. Um, you know, I think as it pertains to sort of access to higher ups or or building awareness there, um, I think I think it's been pretty fruitful. But one thing that's that's sort of evolved over recent years is on an annual basis, I, I think with us in industry, the expectation is you set certain objectives for the year. Um, and, you know, on a, on a more um, microscopic level, we started that with our leaders um, in the organization going back a few years that you, that each, um, each manager, each director and above would have to set a diversity and inclusion objective for the year. Um, and we would help them craft that. And ultimately when you set objectives, you're held accountable. Um, for, for meeting those objectives. And I think it's been really nice this year um, across all of Merck, uh, everyone in the, in the actual bureaucratic system uh, that we have um, is, is there's a, a drop down so that everyone can now set a DNI objective. And so I think um, in as much as sort of going through that process um, can feel onerous, um, I think the fact that we, we 
have that mechanism that allows it to link us to accountability um, provides provides that that progression upward um, to get the attention uh, of those in more senior positions so that so that everyone um, has to sort of stand up and take action. So I don't know if that's something that can be translated to academia, um, but just something that that I've seen um, in in literature before and and seems to have been very effective for us. So I, I have a question for that, Rebecca. I'll follow up with what you said uh, because you know we, we live in an intermediate world between where you live and what these guys actually where they live, and uh, so regarding accountability, how will accountability lead to actually change of culture. At the end, that's what you want. You want people to do this for the right reasons and not because they have to be accountable. Yep. Well, um, ultimately you're accountable for the success of your organization, right? And, 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 and to that end, um, you know, the, 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 the inherent belief is that providing that diversity and inclusion, uh, that culture, that climate um, is, is endemic um, to what we want to deliver. And so in a scientific organization, um, the, the conclusion is that we should be able to innovate, we should be able to deliver on uh, the Merck pipeline um, needs um, by bringing in that diversity and inclusion. And so um, I think that's where, that's where the key piece of accountability is, is that we've got a portfolio of, of compounds, a portfolio of products and deliverables um, that we're leveraging uh, our efforts around DEI in order to um, in order in order to accomplish and and recognizing that um, that that portfolio of opportunities is uh, not static um, and there are plenty of new uh, new modalities new new uh, new um, new opportunities that exist at interfaces of of, of science. Um, I think it's it's absolutely fundamental that we have a diverse team such that we can deliver on, on that portfolio. So stay there, Rebecca, because you have a, there's a question for you, but I think right. it'll be actually expanded to the rest of the panel. This is for um, uh, Anna Duran. She says, Rebecca, is there an accountability framework, talking about accountability, and a set of metrics that assesses status of, and progress of the initiatives of America? Um, I say, I think so. Um, so, you know, I think, I think there are two, there are two things that, that we have to, to, to do. Um, and one has, you know, given that our journey hasn't been super long, um, you know, we've, we've sort of, we've said, if we, if we focus exclusively on metrics, then we're going to be sort of teaching to the test, uh, so to speak. So we have to, we have to utilize metrics, uh, in in a in an intelligent way, um, so so in the most immediate sense, you know the the feedback is anecdotal, um, but um, but I think we do set our set a benchmark for ourselves in terms of the feedback from our HR organization. There's a diversity center of excellence um, with whom we collaborate, and so getting the feedback on that from them on on our activities and our progress is important. Um, you know, when it does come to metrics, when we sort of start putting that out there, I think there are there are three things that we we do look at: uh, recruiting, retention, and progression. And so, um, on the on the recruiting front, you know that that's pretty easy to to put numbers to, right? You can see what that if you're taking deliberate actions, um, what the what the outcomes of that are. Um, I feel. So I think that's that's a leading indicator um, for retention and progression. Progression, you know, if it's if you link it to promotion, that also you can you can capture. Um, but if it's not promotion and it's just progression, how do you do that? And so I think the the lagging indicator there really does does center around sort of the overall diversity of the organization. And so if we, um, I think we can agree that. Um, sort of the, the talent we're looking to recruit, the talent we're looking to retain values our commitment to diversity and inclusion and has, is, their success is enabled uh, by that commitment to inclusion. Our ability to retain all the diverse talent whom we're trying to hire um, is sort of an important metric that gives us a sense of how we are doing on that front. So how about in the academia? Uh, 
Okay, sure. Uh, no, accountability is critical, of course. You know, again, uh, it, it is a metric of success of anything that you are doing. So, you know, what, what are the metrics that we will use in academia? Well, demographics is one, right? So we see the changes uh, or the persistent demographics in the student population, in the faculty, in the staff. Uh, and we identify when, you know, when we don't have proper representation and keep an eye on that. Uh, now, the, one of the be best metrics is, is, is something that President uh, Hrabowski mentioned, and that's the persistence of students in science. That is something that we have been following at UCLA very, very closely for about five years now. And because it is a reflection of, of, of many factors, is, is, is the, the general climate of the organization, is whether or not we have inclusive education practices, uh, and that's directly the faculty. So it's a reflection of how the faculty are adopting a growth mindset. You know, it reflects uh, uh, your, your um, uh, grading schemes. It is a really complex parameter that tells you why or why are students not succeeding in, in, in science, in STEM, whether they are underrepresented minorities or they are from the global majority, right? So, so there, are, there are a number of, of, of metrics, uh, you know, so, and, and I think uh, uh, we are very vigilant as an organization. I think everybody wants, uh, wants uh, uh, our university to, to, to move the needle in that direction. I should say that the events of last year that from what happened a year ago, uh, you know, the, the, we, everybody in our community has been deeply sensitized about uh, structural uh, inequities in our society. And I think everybody is convinced that it is a time not to just say it, but act on it. This is the time to really move the needle. So we, we're very energized right now. And probably that's one of the reasons we're having this, uh, this uh, workshop. And I think we as a community, this is the right time really to, to make a significant progress. But yeah, metrics are important. Accountability is super important. So I know that we're coming close on time, um, and I saw several questions in the uh, Q and A around strategies. Um, so I'm I'm going to put two resources into the chat uh, for everybody. I put two links there. One is a handbook chapter by Kimberly Griffin that I highly recommend. A handbook of higher ed chapter. It is an exhaustive meta review of the social science around diverse the strategies that work for diversifying faculty. Um, and then the second is actually a summary that I wrote with Kimberly um, to, to really, that's really geared towards uh, institutional leaders to help them kind of understand some of the social science research. So if you're new to social science, you might start with the summary, which is much shorter. Um, but, but I did want to kind of, kind of I, I hate to, I hope I'm not harping here, but I did want to kind of remind folks that, that strategies are really a band-aid. They should be used as a stopgap measure to address a systemic issue, right? And I just kind of want to hit that home again, that like um, when your systems that currently are working aren't working well and you need to implement something to support that, you know, to support a group of people because the system is working, it means the system is failing them. So, you know, um, the strat these implementation strategies are great and they should be used in tandem with evolving kind of structures and practices so that the systems at large work for everybody. Um, so just tossing that out there, but two really helpful resources. All right, we're running out of time, but uh, I'd like to actually add this question. And uh, so if you can be brief, that would be appreciated. Uh, this is from uh, Sylvia Zepp. Uh, she's asked, uh, is there a way for an incoming graduate student, a student to find out which graduate departments are more supportive in mentoring, nurturing, and retaining diverse talent? Uh, I'll quickly say yes. Um, speaking to other students and speaking to alumni from those spaces are probably some of the best ways you can do that. And I always encourage graduate students to not feel at all, like to give them permission. You have permission to reach out to people and to say, I'm looking at this program and I'd love to learn about your experience. Um, so. Uh, that's that's one way you can do it. I think the other way is to look for institutions that are participating in programs like we've been describing. Look to see what programs are participating in Sea Change or the Aspire Alliance or ACS's iGen Network. Um, there are specific programs aimed at this, and that's a great way to kind of find out who's got skin in the game, who's really doing this work. 
interview the faculty, you know, contact the students, but also talk to the faculty, you know, so you, you get a really good idea of what the, their mindset is and good, you know, faculty who are supportive, you, you'll identify them immediately. So, yeah. I, and, and, you know, faculty like to, good faculty like to talk to students, take advantage of that. And I'll extrapolate that to industry for when, when you get through graduate school and, and you're looking for jobs and you choose to go into industry, um, <laughs> you know, you can, you can certainly um, sort of ask the same questions of, of, of alumni um, and, and friends you have at, at various companies. Um, but I think the other, the other piece that applies um, broadly is uh, follow, follow different places on social media. Um, you can definitely see there's, a, there's that hashtag chem Twitter community um, you know, which I think people do a, a really good job of publicizing um, what their what their companies or their universities are doing um, to support DEI. So it's just another way to bring visibility around such things. Right. Thank you very much. I mean, I'd like to thank all of our speakers uh, today and the panelists and uh, the questions were excellent. And I would like to thank you for your inspiring presentations and also your great insight. So, uh, so kudos to you guys. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, so we now formally adjourn our uh, part one of session one, and now we're going to go into a 20 minute break, coffee break. Uh, please make sure to return at 2.50, okay, Easter time, so we can begin the next session. Once again, thank you to all the speakers this, this morning and, uh, and, the, and the panelists. <laughs>